Hey everybody, good news everyone. Um, I will be creating some videos for your Unit 2 Cambridge Technicals Level 3 Digital Media course. Um, we didn't really get a chance to do Unit 2 much in class and I'm hoping it's going to give you a chance to, to make sure you don't miss out on any of the learning. But for this week I want to continue with some of the work that we started last time round on media companies and moving that forward to show that we've got some better examples looking at some of the media theories. Now this is work that we covered in Unit 1, uh, work that you probably have notes for, but one of the things that I have found in marking not just your work but in other students' work across the whole uh, board is that the understanding of these theories and putting them into practice is what's going to help you when it comes to exams and ultimately later on your coursework. Now the theories aren't complex, perhaps the names are the trickiest bit for some of them, just remembering who they are and what they're about. I'm going to go through them very, very brief with you and then set uh, the world's best distance learning. So for our media theory stuff today, what I want you to be looking at is several different theories and applying them to that media product. Okay, the media product is your choice. Remember, that could mean a film, a TV series, uh, it could mean a radio show, it could be a musical track, it could be anything really that is consumable media, video games as well, of, of course. There, I would try to make sure that you've got a selection. We never really know what's going to be in the exam, and so it's always good to be prepared for all sorts of different possibilities. The mock paper we did recently asked about violence in media, now, of course, many of you did start talking about video games, but of course, that's not the only way that that could have been answered. You could have talked about films, you could have talked about anything else. You should really make sure that you know a little bit of everything. So to start with our first theory, we've got Levi Strauss. OK, so Levi Strauss was the idea that stories, narrative, uh, conflict in, uh, in a show, in a media product is all about binary opposites, the good versus evil, the black versus white, the light and dark, the uh, different opposites provide some sort of conflict into a story. Okay, And for that we're, we're looking at the way the, the cameras are used, the way the director is taking the shots in terms of a movie or TV show, uh, props, lights, costumes, um, and once you once you get into your head about opposition, it's actually really easy to see it. Now, I'm just going to put this up here with very little comment. Uh, some of you are going to know exactly where this uh, still is from, what film it's from. Um, I'm going to just say straight up, who is the bad one and who is the good one? Well, perhaps some of you might say that that's different depending on how you see the film but I would suggest that the lighting, the makeup, the costume design heavily hints at one of these characters being a more traditional bad person than the other one. This is a, an example of that binary position. Okay, now the film is much more complicated than that. There has all sorts of subplots and narratives and backstory and history and lore going on. But it would be a very clear example. And you could take a look at a show, for instance, to see that bad guys tend to be in shadows and in dark. Uh, the heroes tend to be filmed in such a way they always seem quite light. Okay, uh, a shadow coming over someone's face is never usually a good thing. Thing. The, the darkness coming over someone's body is usually means something bad is about to happen. Okay, um, So yeah, think about Levi Strauss, binary opposition. Uh, Tolerov, so five-step narrative. Um, there are many different ways the narrative can be explained. As a basic, basic core concept, this is kind of how most stories are told. Now I do say stories because of course this does happen in musical tracks as well. It happens in radio, uh, happens in theatre and, um, and, and, and all sorts of stuff here. We've got an equilibrium. So when I say equilibrium, what I'm talking about there is the normal, where the world is. So a film, a TV show, a song may start by stating what's happening now. There's usually then a disruption, something changes, um, uh, there's a recognition that that thing has now changed, there is usually an attempt to repair it, and then there is a new equilibrium. That new equilibrium is whether or not the repair was successful or not, 
um, and that cycle can repeat. Think of a, of a long-running TV series, for instance. This cycle will repeat several times over the course of a season. Um, in musical tracks, you'll often find the use of chorus would usually have something about the attempt to repair. Um, but again, it depends on, on the genre and the style that we're going for. Uh, I tried to pick this one here uh, with distance learning and Disney Plus means that I'm watching quite a lot of Disney stuff at the moment with my uh, family. So Wally, -E. um, if you've not seen Wally, -E, then I tried to pick something that you might know the story of. Um, so it starts off with this uh, robot character who is, uh, for all intents and purposes, the last creature almost on Earth, which has been abandoned. He's picking up trash. Um, he's actually got a cockroach friend, but that doesn't matter too much. He's picking up trash and trying to sort of sort things out, uh, trying to clear up the Earth. Uh, there is a disruption to his day-to-day -day existence when a new robot, Eve, uh, lands on the planet and is ultimately quite confused as to what's going on. It turns out that, that she's looking for, for a particular thing, he attempts to make friends, he recognises that this character here is a bit confused, he recognises that's happening to him, he's, he's seen a TV show where characters give each other flowers, so he, he finds a plant which he then gives to the character. Uh, it turns out that this plant is the thing that Eve is looking for, and they they go up to the ship, They uh, the spaceship, uh, they give the plant to the owner, which is what they're supposed to be doing, turns out that the owner is a little bit evil um, and so there's an attempt to repair the damage the owner is is very grumpy that they they found this plant and means everyone's gonna have to return back to earth um, and eventually they are successful though and they bring the ship and all the people back and the new equilibrium is formed um, that would then potentially re-spiral around if there was ever sequels and that sort of stuff. But a five-step narrative formula, uh, most TV film shows that you're going to, to see or have heard of will follow this. Um, and as soon as you notice it, you're, you're almost waiting for the next bit. You know full well that something good is going to happen eventually. Uh, Mulvey, objectification of women. Okay, so of of all the ones that I did get for the exam paper, this is the one that people seem to to grasp, and I'm I'm shocked as to why. Uh, Mulvey suggests that women, uh, especially in the media, are primarily objects of male attraction, and they're body, their physical body is objectified in some way, they, which he calls the male gaze. Um, controversially, maybe, perhaps, it's just that women accept this objectification because uh, that idea is reinforced in the media, okay, that women will see uh, women objectified so much so that they, they take that as a new normal, and, and she would use an argument so that the, the idea that women are and wearing makeup and wearing pretty clothes and the idea is that they're trying to make themselves more beautiful which is not necessarily a male motivation um whether or not that's always true is is up to you but you can take a look at various different media shows it didn't take me long to find find this sort of stuff here where you'll see uh female characters in some way overly stylized or sexualized in some way um this image here is a is a particularly interesting one from transformers megan fox fixing a car in the most uncomfortable way possible her co-star reshoots it in the same sort of way and and you can see how ridiculous it looks like on him but for her that was the director's choice at that particular point um we've got uh the, this is from uh, one of the james bond films i think the world is not enough um again bond girls have a very potted history of usually just being there just to, to decorate the scene in some way um in fact for this particular one was a particularly um, weird example where she had a, a very very strange name which didn't seem to make much sense throughout the entire film until the very last line of the film where it set up perhaps the worst and cringiest James Bond pun that has ever existed and James Bond films are full of puns uh, it, it was particularly jarring uh, 
I'll let you try and find that one on Netflix or wherever it may well be. Williamson. So Williamson was, um, much like Mulvey, was looking at, uh, especially women, um, looking at gender roles and stereotyping, but was looking at sort of down the advertising route more uh, and, and was talking about the idea that women and indeed men tend to fall into very well-defined gender roles and it's difficult to break out of those. In fact, if you try to break out of those, you're seen as some avant-garde amazing person uh, because because that seemed as strange um, and we can see that I would say like this advert here was a very very old-fashioned style wow even a woman could open it it's 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 incredible sort of just how that's a, that's a very jarring sexist tone to that advert but it's not really changed a much more modern advert there again the way that shot there is elements of that being the objectification, but in terms of this one here, we've also got very much, are you beach body ready? And it's very much advertising weight loss product. It's aimed at women. It's saying, you need to look like this. Your role is to be something to men to look at. Um, we've got the Avengers. Now, as a general rule of thumb, the Marvel films aren't too bad to women, other than the fact that they don't give them their standalone movies very often. Um, they're very much side characters. But in terms of the adverts, they're very, very stereotypical. You will often find the uh, uh, Captain America and Thor and, and Iron Man and all that doing the, uh, the hero jumps landing three points one fist two knees on the floor um but when it comes to for instance especially in the earlier films the female characters in the movies uh so you've got scarlett johansson here as a black widow again you take a look at the actual pose that she's pulling in this advert this was uh, a poster for the film and it seems incredibly strange uh the way that she's walking on tiptoes um that she the way that she's moving her body from side to side the swish of the hair the way that the pistols are held sort of unnaturally to the side but what all that does is it highlights her curves uh it highlights that whether or not that's been photo edited in some way um the way it's shot is very very strange when you think about it but i imagine many people when they first saw that form oh it's just it's just happening and that's media that's where we have in some way accepted a stylized way if i saw uh spider-man walking like that or iron man looking like that i would find that quite strange and if that's the best example of of someone changing that would be something like deadpool um the deadpool movies are also um marvel as well um but the it's a, sort of very much a satire on, on that sort of genre in many ways. And Deadpool makes a really big play where he acts quite what we would say is feminine. Uh, some of the posters for that are, are very, very stylized. And, you know, he it wouldn't be particularly strange to see the Deadpool character like this. And it's seen as comedic. It's seen as over-the-top, exaggerated comedy. But when Scarlett Johansson like that it's seen as normal take that how you will okay so our next uh theory final theory today is altman audience pleasures uh three categories emotional visceral intellectual so emotional does the media product make me feel happy am i watching it to make myself feel happy um you may think about that in the sense well surely everything is there to make you feel happy uh in in the sense of this here we we'll, we'll, Think of TV shows. Think of something like, why does someone watch, for instance, Love Island? Okay. Why does someone watch um, celebrity gossip shows or This Morning or the news? Or why do they watch uh, documentaries about animals? Okay. What's the emotional connection there? What is the feeling that they're trying to achieve in that? And how does that media product appeal to that feeling? Um, you'll often find that in terms of, um, let's say, Planet Earth, the David Attenborough series, the emotions that they will try and have there, they will try and blend a story, create a story from the animals so we empathise with them. They'll have mixtures of things going on. So sometimes you'll feel sad, happy. Sometimes you'll see 
animals caring for young and it may feel, make you feel a certain level of emotion towards them and and that sometimes then also links down to the visceral so the visceral is a gut response your excitement your fear your laughter um, and that can be highlighted in media by use of audio or special effects um, someone jumping out of the shadows is not as scary as someone jumping out the shadows with a massive a uh, spike of violin music for instance okay the screech of the violin as someone reaches towards them okay the gut response is the fear okay and it's also one of the reasons why in comedy shows for instance uh you'll hear canned laughter so friends is a great example of a uh, visceral because of the use of canned laughter um so in that show they use canned laughter pre-recorded tracks of people laughing um to heighten the jokes it in some ways makes them more funny uh, when you hear other people laugh you are more likely to join in and you can compare shows like friends to something like peep show in channel four um which is filmed in a very very different style and without the laughter it can it can feel like uh, it's, it's just a different experience. It's a gut response. You you tend to find it more cringy at times. Think of The Office, if you've ever seen that as well. Um, the lack of the, of the laughter tracks. And of course, the last audience pleasure is the intellectual. Everyone likes to think that they are smart. And everyone likes to feel like they would know something more than someone else. And quiz shows especially, game shows definitely appeal to this. Now, some of that is that they will tailor who they actually have on the show to to make the audience feel like they're smarter than them uh, there is a, a level of pleasure there but you know even the, the noise the effects they have when something right happens or something brilliant happens uh, you may even get intellectual in the sense of uh, foreshadowing in movies in um, drama shows where foreshadowing the concept where you the the show is suggesting what's going to happen next in advance and so you're kind of almost dreading it and it's like oh, i knew it was going to be that i knew that they were going to do that that was obviously going to happen i'm so clever for being able to work that out so the intellectual response the pleasure that some people get from watching those sorts of murder mystery shows as well um so using some examples for for this here um i just it's easy to find these sorts of things and one of the reasons why we as people like certain shows or dislike certain shows is because what sort of pleasure that appeals to us so making sure then that with shows like love island um that they use that emotion very very well they try and make sure that you you've got that that feeling you you empathize with them it makes you happy to see it. it's a guilty pleasure in some way there there might be some visceralness in that the excitement of whether or not something's going to happen or not intellectually does it make you think well for some people i guess there might be a little bit of, of envy or i'm i'm better than them they may be pretty and young but i'm smarter than perhaps or something like this but there is reasons why those sorts of shows exist so your task this week is to watch some media um seriously it's just all i really need done for you okay i need some examples i need case studies when it comes to your exams the the thing that's missing is your knowledge of media companies and your knowledge of media theories links to actual products so i want you to find an example of a five-step narrative i want you to find some gender roles and stereotyping i want you to see if you can find an example of male gaze uh, i would like you to see if you can work your way through all of those and find a really good example of some binary opposites and how it moves through the film okay uh, I want at least one media product for each of those theories so that is a TV show a film a game uh, a musical track a radio show okay I want at least one for each of those theories so bonus points if you can get these theories to apply to a single media product if you can find a movie a tv show anything then apply several of those theories to it at the same time then that would be brilliant that's how you're going to get those top marks in those big 20 mark exam questions at the end remember to get the top marks for that you need about three four media products with four or so theories correctly applied to them um, so try and make sure you're picking up as many of those points as you can it's going to be for your future benefit you will have exams you will have research you will have coursework uh, and these theories are the key to all of the stuff that we have left to do so that's it for today 
I need to make sure that you have got all of that completed and submitted to show my homework uh, by the end of this week. Thank you very much. Goodbye.